Hi, my name is Wade Wallerstein, and I'm here today with Umber Majid, uh, who's a multidisciplinary visual artist and educator uh, who received her MFA from the Parsons New School for Design in 2016 and graduated from Beacon House National University in uh, Lahore, Pakistan in 2013. Her writing, performance, and animation, oh, that work engaged with, I don't need to read your whole bio, this is corny. Um, <laughs> I'm here with Umber Majid, a multidisciplinary artist and educator who has her MFA from Parsons. Um, Umber, it's super great to be with you today. Um, and I'm really glad that you had the time. Um, as part of the um, Through the Mesh exhibition at Neem in Cyprus, uh, we'll be showing your work. We'll be showing your work, Trans Pakistan. Um, oh my gosh, well, I'm, would this always like tongue twist me for some reason? Um, <laughs> Uh, Trans Pakistan, Pakistan Zindabad. Zindabad. I was gonna say Zindabad Trans Pakistan, but it's like not Pakistan, but it's it's not. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm we're, I'm here with Umber Majid, wonder and multi interdisciplinary artist, to talk about her work Trans Pakistan Zindabad or Long Live Trans Pakistan, um, as part of the Through the Mesh exhibition at Neem. Um, it's a research project that has been ongoing for a, a, a while. Uh, Umber, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the work, what it is, and your research practice that has resulted in the ultimate installation that folks are going to see at Neem. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, um, Wade and Patrick. Um, I'm so glad to be working and showing alongside really awesome artists. Um, so my research practice basically uses um, uh, a lot of uh, research within family archives. So I use a lot of my grandfather's analog photography, like um, film photography, film prints. I also look at um, my maternal uncle's tourism company and the archives and tourist paraphernalia kind of surrounding that. Um, and so uh, within the last few years, I've been doing projects that kind of use the context of uh, family material, but like point to larger discourses around um, national identity, community building, and um, also kind of um, visibility for femmes and uh, minorities. Um, I'm the certain case study that I use is Pakistan because I'm Pakistani American and I've uh, spent many years in Pakistan living and working there. Um, so what's been really interesting is with the project that I'm showing at this exhibition, it basically functions as a kind of pop-up for my uncle's failed tourism company called Trans Pakistan. That's <laughs> name. It's a fantastic name. Um, so Trans Pakistan Zindabad actually means it's a kind of a cheeky turn on um, Pakistan Zindabad, which is a kind of national chant. And so a little quirky, a little like a uh, cheeky um, title is kind of playing on that of like um, looking at local politics, so both global and local conditions. Um, so I use my uncle's tourism company. Um, one, it's like a digital revitalization because the company existed in the 1990s to uh, early 2000s. And so I'm doing a the basically it's the company is using digital tools so augmented reality um virtual reality um uh, the internet like that as a way to look at land politics specific to um a housing community in lahore pakistan so is there is so trans pakistan functions as a trojan horse uh, to investigate kind of gentrification politics, which is a very um, uh, elaborate research project that I've been doing for the last few years of looking at South Asian diasporic economies and capital and how that kind of uh, speaks to uh, urban and aesthetic uh, decisions in semi-public spaces and which people 
are the users and which people can enter and exit, who are the residents, who are the non-residents, uh, and what are the class politics around all of that. Um, and it's also kind of funny to <laughs> look at a lot of uh, the really interesting um, animal sculptures or the aesthetics, which is very specific to South Asian digital kitsch graphic design, which I am actually very obsessed with. Yeah, so I'm a huge fan. That's a description <laughs> of the project, but go ahead, so, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Um, I was thinking about, you know, this, like it, in a certain way, like the, it feels like Trans Pakistan Zindabad comes out of like a mythology of yourself, a mythology of your family and this, in this lineage, lineage. And I know that like ancestry is super important to your practice and is a current that runs throughout. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about your uncle's company and, you know, how you got obsessed with it and some of the story behind, um, you know, what led to its ultimate failure, as, <laughs> as you said. Yeah, so so my uncle's company um, was basically like an adventure and trekking company that started in Islamabad in the 1990s. And so what was interesting, uh, how I actually came upon uh, my uncle's materials is actually because I was researching my grandfather's photography, as I mentioned before. He was a hobby photographer. He started some photography clubs in Islamabad. He was also uh, uh, very much a believer in the nation of Pakistan, um, considering you know my he was part of the political party that founded Pakistan, and so was my great grandfather. And they migrated from Jalandhar, India. Um, in 1947 and they settled wow. in what is now considered Pakistan. So a lot of the work that I do, even with uh, my grandfather's photography is looking at, you know, his yeah, somewhat being critical of his like patriotic leanings um, and how that translates in his photography work, even if it's like flora and fauna and he's, you know, doing kind of hobby photography like of the cityscape. Um, so I found uh, some uh, pamphlets of my uncle's company and it used both my uncle's photography and my grandfather's photography. And I was very much interested in trying to understand uh, what led to kind of this very specific moment of the demise of the tourism industry in Pakistan, which was in the early 2000s. So, um, it's a very interesting intersection of, in the early 2000s, there was a huge uh, return migration. Um, so Pakistani descent or uh, citizen, Pakistani citizens or dual citizens returned to Pakistan in the early 2000s from Europe, Western Europe and North America due to the implications of 9-11 uh, and um, and it became an interesting place because, you know, there's all this kind of like capital that's coming back and flooding into the country, as well as other industries kind of falling apart because mm -hmm. of, you know, their war, the implications of the war on terror on land, right? So I was actually part of that return migration. I lived in Baksan for about eight years. I moved there when I was 16. Um, and I... And I know many people or many families like myself that have were born and grew up abroad and had to return because they didn't think that there was potentially any future for them in terms of dealing with the authorities or like opportunities for looking the way we looked. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think is not many people understand unless you grew up Muslim post 9-11. Um, but what was also happening on a global scale was a lot of diasporic money, South Asian diasporic money was flooding both into Dubai and flowing back into Pakistan. And so if we fast forward to 2020 or even 2019, 2018, the state has now recognized diaspora capital as a, 
as a real economy. So the recent prime minister, Imran Khan, he um, started a campaign called Once a Pakistani, Always a Pakistani. And so he tours around North America and Western Europe persuading you know, rich Pakistani doctors to like fund the uh, state infrastructure like a dam. Um, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. That's crazy. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Also that it's kind of like a, a battle between the state that recognizes this money as well as in um, this private corporation, Baria Town, which I'm doing all this research about. Um, they're basically considered a land mafia. There have been a number of court cases against them in the last few years. And they've paid, you know, you know, they paid what they had, they paid their dues, but they're still doing the things that they're doing. So they're taking land that is essentially owned by villagers for many generations and uh, ousting them out, creating really in a way kind of dystopic gray housing in the middle of these villages in Lahore, which have like also replicas of like the Eiffel Tower, Trafalgar Square, um, as well as um, asking, the, also um, getting the people that they bought the land from to become the labor. So, so people who used to own the land potentially are like drivers or maids or so they're basically, um, so it's a huge shift in terms of who has power and it's, and the people that own most of these houses are South Asian, Pakistani diaspora. Mm. Um, so there becomes a really interesting tension between um, a kind of, um, a, a push between um the idealized like western ideals of like we have huge symbols of like the eiffel tower and trafalgar square and a sphinx uh that's not modern western but it's like <laughs> kitsch enough you know it's like but it's the, kind of like I, british I, museum iconography you know yeah right and which is super messed up because you know you know pakistan was a british colony and um, but what's also interesting is like, they also have co-opted aesthetics from, um, the subaltern. So considering like they hire garden sculptors along that, like that used to, that, like most of these crafts people are like, still live in that area, which is kind of the outskirts of the city. And they hire them to make these like kitsch strange like animal sculptures and like many of them and so i've been interested in trying to find a way to um tap into that kind of um imagery and you know interview the craftsmen and like also reproduce um or thinking about the idea of copy culture because there's two different kind of culture copy copy cultures that are happening at the same time between like those in power that are trying to bring the world to you by recreating you know being a Pakistani citizen for many you can't travel abroad because you have a Pakistani passport so why not bring the world to you just pay us a bunch of money and then get to the top of the Eiffel Tower for five rupees and then you look out and you see all you see is a beige imaginary right you just see beige houses as far as you can see or you can another way or the way trans Pakistan is trying to like focus in is looking at the idea of bootleg culture copy culture that is very much the uh, aesthetic in South Asia um, and in India media theorists Ravi Sundaram writes about it in his book called Pirate Modernity which is super interesting and so thinking of trans pakistan and networks and services is there a way in which there can be representation of um you know those who've been ousted out to re-enter baria town on different terms mm.
totally. Um, I mean, there's so much to unpack in, in all of this. And I'm quite interested in this concept of diasporic imagery, um, the bootleg aesthetic that you're describing. Um, and I'd love to, you know, I'd love to know kind of through this research practice, like what have you uncovered about it? And what have you uncovered about um, how it influences action um, or, you know, ingrain certain ideas into different groups of people? Um, I don't know, I'm quite my, um, you know, the, I'm quite interested in the way that some of these images, you know, it's cause it, it's, it's, it's copy culture, but it's also like, it's like cycle culture. It's like images move from place to place to place and get iterated on every time. And then it just kind of passes around. It's like this really interesting movement. Um, but that passing that movement, like circulationism is that new vector of power that is kind of holding on to things. And I mean, this, this, what you're describing about, you know, kind of the taking of the land and making these like weird animal sculptures and whatever else in the Eiffel Towers. Like I think of the um, like early 2000s, like American Renaissance, uh, like construction that happened in Northern Italy um, where you right. have, and that are now like abandoned. You have all these like empty, like faux gilded, you know, castles in this like super tacky, you know, American McMansion style. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and that ultimately had, a, I know that that there had a really, uh, a profound psychological impact on the people who live there. And so, yeah, I'm wondering like more about this diasporic imagery, what it looks like, what it feels like to you and what kind of power or control that it might have amongst different South Asian populations. So I'd like to refer to maybe um, Amara Maksud, who's a really well-known Pakistani uh, British um, academic. She wrote a book called The New Pakistani Middle Class, which basically outlines like two different movements that are happening both in urban space and, and also the political field trying to outline where conservatism is re-entering into the Islamic Republic in Pakistan and how it manifests in interactions between people, but then also in the urban scape and advertising. So when I refer to um, these uh, different kind of kitsch cultures or like representations in the urban scape, they come from very uh, different um, uh, they're made for specific people and they function in a specific way. And depending on your subjectivity, you're, you get to kind of interact with it. That is obvious that I'm just putting it out there. But um, so the uh, examples that I can give are, um, and I think you've given great examples too. So like when I first came across kind of replicas, not only looking at like Las Vegas and looking at Umberto Echo's um, like studies on like replica or copy culture um, in his book called uh, Hyper Real Travels or something, Hyper Reality, Travels in Hyper Reality, I think. Um, so he's like focuses specifically in America, but there's something very particular about copy culture in the Manasa region. So Middle East, North Africa, South Asia region. A great example I can give is we talked about the Eiffel Tower that's in Beria town and how that um, kind of um, shows the, the who is in power. So mm -hmm. Beria town is empowered. It's a private, private corporation that uses the name of the state. Beria means Navy. No one, no naval officer is part of Beria Town, and yet they use the name of the state to be legitimized, right? So they own this, and it functions as a tourist spot. So non residents can be in that space, they generate money, and they the performativity of having people go through multiple security clearances to then go along the performativity of the Eiffel Tower and going to the top to see the world of Beria Town, that in itself is a psychological experience, right? And then another example in the other part, another part of the region is um, I was in Dubai doing a research residency um, at Jamil Art Center um, and I was doing research into 
housing uh, replicas in housing communities there because they also have a very particular copy culture, you know. So, and a great example is about the Eiffel Tower at a housing community there because they were building an Eiffel Tower, but the entire inside of the Eiffel Tower was going to be filled with corporate offices. So the way it functions is state and corporation are corporation are the same, one and the wow. same. And so therefore it affects the way, like that is a great example of like how, like these, like who is in power and like what is the function of how users or citizens are supposed to experience the space, right? Mm. And so for me, it's thinking about if this is the case um, in Barrier Town, where they use this idea of the user body and like the performativity of up and down kind of vertical and like um, uh, satellite imagery and like access to like macro aesthetics, right? What is the way in which trans Pakistan can kind of access things on an underground level, you know, um, ground level? Um, and so this refers back to Ravi Sundaram's ideas of networks, subaltern networks, glitched networks, you know, bootleg mm -hmm. culture that media bootleg culture, let me clarify. Uh, like we can think back to when um, uh, DVDs, like bootleg Bollywood DVDs, you just burn them up and you sell them out. So, <laughs> I don't know who's calling me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So um, using, so the, the pixelation used in uh, these bootleg media is a representation of those who can access certain things. And it's so super hush hush. You like, you go to the specific market down the street and you ask the guy for, you know, the latest Bollywood DVD and they'll give you the glitched up copy. And that's just, it is. That's how media is consumed. And that is a representation of this economy of those who um, have access to it and how it's an insider culture, right? It's it's kind of, you kind of pass it down. It's a one-to-one -one exchange. You can't, mm. it's not kind of widespread like that. So what does that mean? Is there a way in which trans Pakistan can, you know, access that kind of, not only media, like exchange of media or technology or information, but even the aesthetics attached to that and kind of enunciate those aesthetics. Mm -hmm. If that means, if that refers to handmade um, replicas, right? So we're talking, there's two kinds of like copies that are happening, sophisticated large scale copies made by Beria Town, right? Which refer to, um, Western uh, modernisms, but also refer to the Islamic states because they've renamed the Trafalgar Square, Tahid Square, which <laughs> is like in the name of God, right? So <laughs> I love that. That's so, honestly kind of cool. It's like, you know, it's it's fucked up, but it's also, you know, it feels like a little screw you to the queen or something, you know, like it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And the highest thing that you see is the name of God instead of on Nelson's column instead of there being a soldier there's like the name of God in like 3d Islamic arts and so everywhere you drive around on the roundabout the highest point is the name of God and again the performativity of height right mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. the user is doing um at what given point even on ground whether they get to the top or not you know and so what would it mean if the pedestrian the person without a car the non-resident was able to walk around Beria town and point their phone at a monument or a roundabout which is accessible to non-residents and have kind of their narrative or aesthetics kind of surrounding them, kind of bring them back 
to their situation or even using speculative fiction to project, you know, a different kind of future, right? A different kind of present even. Um, so those are a lot of ideas that I just threw out at you, but- No, I'm. Um, it's mm-hmm. really interesting. Like I- you know, I'm, you know, you, you spoke about that. What, one thing that I was curious about while you were talking was you were talking about this one-to-one really intimate relationship that happens, you know, as media is trans moves from hand to hand, but, you know, in talking about piracy, I immediately think about, um, like, like seeding and leaching and, um, what's the word? Why can't I think of the word for this? Um, oh my gosh, I used to do so much of this as a kid. Um, (laughs) torrenting you know torrent yeah, yeah, culture yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah. and online pirate culture but also social media right and like one to many platforms like youtube um and different video hosting sites like what i mean you know not to not to play devil's advocate or counter you but i'm wondering how those types of media complicates this complicate this situation um or otherwise you know play a role in this kind of transference that's that's happening well, a that's lot the right word of, in this, in this, in that's the right word in this uh, ecosystem that's developed through bootleg culture. Right, right. So, I mean, as many, I mean, there's different protocols in different countries in the Manasa region, but in Pakistan, lots of people use VPNs. You know, a lot of things are like you have to be careful what you post or what you don't post or what you look online because you know the state is watching. Um, And so what is actually available and accessible to you uh, on like, on like a a platform in which the state can kind of like control, um, users have to find alternative spaces. And those alternative spaces are torrenting, are these other networks, right? Yes, I'm talking about a one-to-one interaction, right? In let's say in the the case of, you know, exchanging or kind of like, kind of sociality uh, around uh, user experience in these like subaltern networks. But there's also um, uh, all these other, internet practices in Pakistan and other parts of the world like that where it's embedded. It's like, you know, someone that knows someone and they'll like give you their VPN and everything is hidden. And like, that's just how you have to function Mm -hmm. um, from the state. And so I also like, I was just in Pakistan, as I mentioned two weeks ago, And I went for like a family thing, but I also was doing research. The last day before I left, the whole city shut down. The whole city shut down because there was a protest happening on one of the main streets by um, a political, very conservative Islamic political party. Um, And so that reframed the city from doing anything, going anywhere. There was nowhere you could go because it kind of congested the city, you know, all parts of the city. Mm. So that's what it's like living in that part of the region where you just like wake up and you're like, oh, the whole shitty city has shut down. Cool. I'm just gonna, gonna like reroute my entire life for the next few days. Cool. So considering that it's, it's these, there's a lot of protocols that I potentially have to think through if this project has to happen on ground Mm. in Pakistan, right? Right now it's more speculative, you know, um, approach by having exhibitions abroad, right? In different parts of the States you know, countries outside of Pakistan. But I think the real interesting challenge, and I hope there will be a possibility at some point um, to go back to Pakistan and try to find a way to um, actually have have a portion of the project be 
kind of performed against the performativity of barrier town like actually having pedestrian bodies walk around with an app trans box on app and reclaiming um these semi-public spaces so that actually brings me to my last question for you which i've been thinking about um and in this practice, in this kind of exploration of these aesthetics and also your family history, also the political network um, that constrains and defines action. I've been thinking a lot about protocols recently and the protocols that we have to live with and what they, how they shape us in this space that's meant to be so free. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what kind of, you know, from as you've moved through this project and as you've worked out through all these different speculative levels, you know, what, how can you, what's, how do I ask this? Like what kinds of tools or what kinds of methodologies can one use to either repurpose the image or reclaim it or to skirt around some of the confining, constricting, oppressing, oppressive, damaging, colonial, uh, you know, roots of the larger network infrastructure? I, I mean, I think that is the kind of work that I'm interested in doing and I will continue to work in whatever way or that, that is possible for me as like, that's like a lot. <laughs> that's a lot of work. Um, but it's also, I, I think for me, the main thing that I'm interested in is being as intentional uh, in the purpose of all my research and also being very aware of my subjectivity, my positionality and who I'm speaking to and like the importance of that. So for me, and that has been like kind of illustrated in other projects as well, this idea of like, I'm not necessarily gonna translate everything. Um, a lot of the, my videos have, are in Urdu uh, and in English, and a lot of them are kind of uh, humorous in terms of, there's a lot of wordplay um, and I don't translate a lot of things. And so the purpose is because it's for a multilingual, um, diasporic, like non-English speaking, it's geared towards people that can like can also understand no problem <laughs> go ahead <laughs> we're trying to try, um, like i put to not disturb on like leave me alone jeez <laughs> you're a very busy person wade <laughs> so <laughs> so um yeah so looking at that and not translating everything being very intentional of if it is showing in a place like um like that's why a lot of the pieces are going to even what's going to be shown at the exhibition it's going to be a newer iteration right so every time I get to show some work I get to re play with the site specificity of it, whether I include certain elements, I add some installation elements that I didn't otherwise, you know, it's very specific. And then um, I think also the idea of specifically within trans Pakistan's in the BOG project, I've been really much, I'm trying to tap in and give uh, visibility to, or give, make it more serious of a, uh, of a, a serious, but not so serious investigation of South Asian kitsch. So it's like, everyone will like, everyone loves South Asian or um, a kitsch that you see in like, immigrant communities in the States, right? You go to Jackson Heights in Queens in New York and you'll have like typos everywhere in English, but really bright colors and like really weird collaging. I love that stuff. That stuff that I grew up with, that stuff, that aesthetic, that maximalist aesthetic is very specific to lower middle-class South Asians, both 
in diaspora and like back at home. That's the thing that kind of is kind of reproduced in the States, let's say, right? You look at a uh, Pakistani post, Pakistan Post, which is a New York diasporic newspaper um, that has all of the ads are like, don't you want to go home or don't you want to go back for pilgrimage or whatever? And then they have super kitsch, like, like you, they'll have a dome and like a person sitting on the dome or like something like really weird and interesting. And so that kind of displacement is something that is very present in like online aesthetics as well, like memes and stuff like that. And so how, how does, um, how can I, kind of point to and ground the kind of um, the nuances of this aesthetic, right? That is happening in, that might be disseminated online, but is actually uh, a kind of craft, right? So working with these garden sculptors, right? Um, talking to them about um, the process of using fiberglass, which is a super toxic material and creating these replicas of these, animal sculptures that are used in people's, that people buy for their gardens, but are essentially also used and commissioned by Beria Town. How every replica has an imprint of the craftsman hand. It is a copy of this mold, but because of how fiberglass works, it is essentially its own unique thing. And so I think there's like a beauty to that. And there's something specific about that. There's a copy culture, but there's an imprint mm. of that copy. And what is that imprint? And so in all elements in this installation, a lot of it are hand drawn by myself based off of images I've taken. And even in the interactive web piece that will be in the show, potentially, yeah. And in that piece, the user, the person that will be sitting and using the mouse or whatever, they will be able to redraw some animals that are kind of like based off of what I've seen in Beria Town, right? And so that in itself is, you know, where's the residue? Where is the mark? How are you interacting with this? Um, so I want it to, the aesthetic, not to just be research and like to trace and the grounding, all of that, but it's also of like, how do you reenact that mm -hmm. as a sociality? If yeah. this aesthetic exists, if this network exists, how do we activate it in a way that could potentially lead to uh, non-residents, lower middle class, uh, not men, <laughs> not nuclear families to be able to engage with this material. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wow. I'm so excited to work on this install with you, Umber. This is really exciting. Um, and I am excited for the audience to see more, learn more and dig into some of the materials. It's something you kind of have to see and re to, to really feel, I think, um, and to, for them to dive into some of the aesthetics that you, you spoke about. Thank you so much. Thank you.